Good afternoon and welcome to the Physician Practice Panel, Tips and Strategies for Surviving COVID-19. My name is Kathy Zito. I'm the CEO of Lighthouse Healthcare Advisors and a long-standing member of the Maryland chapter of HFMA. Before we get started, I'd like to make a few administrative announcements. There will be a few polls taken throughout um, the webinar to assist our panelists and our moderator in understanding you, the audience. These polls are used to verify attendance also. Attendees must complete the polls in order to be awarded CPEs. Webinar attendees are in listen only and view only mode. They will not be able to share their screen or speak. If you would like to ask a question to the moderator or the panelist, please use your Q&A function. I'd like to start by introducing my fellow volunteers, Luke Bengel, who's also a manager at Lighthouse Healthcare Advisors, and Jay Wagner, the Director of Physician Fee Revenue Cycle at University of Maryland Faculty Physicians. Together, the three of us have set out to provide a panel discussion that will provide valuable tips and strategies on how to cope with the issues that we're all facing with COVID-19. We have panelists from primary care specialty practices, multi-specialty practices, both small and large, independent, employed, and affiliated practices. Our hope is that you'll take away some valuable insights from our discussion. So Jay, as our moderator, take it away. Kathy, thank you so much for the introduction. I appreciate it. And I wanna welcome all of our uh, attendees on the uh, webinar today. It's my pleasure to serve as the moderator for uh, today's discussion. We had a really great panel uh, for you uh, from a multitude of different um, backgrounds, experiences, and uh, organizational levels to really help give a diversity uh, of thought and experience as it relates to the responses to COVID-19 and what those lessons learned were uh, across each of the different organizations. So it's my opportunity now to uh, introduce our, our four panelists um, I'll introduce them and then I'll turn it over to them uh, to give a brief overview about their own organization, just to give you an idea of the size and scope of the uh, practices or practice that they own. Um, and then we'll be right into the questions. Uh, so to start, we have Bill Elliott, who is the Chief Operating Officer for the University of Maryland Faculty Physicians Incorporated. Uh, Rob Lyles, the Senior Director of Physician Delivery Systems, Mercy Medical Center. John Medicino, the Executive Director for the Centers for Advanced ENT Care, and Dr. Mark Posner, who's the owner of Downtown Baltimore Family Care. Uh, Bill, I'll turn it over to you just to give a quick overview on uh, University of Maryland FPI. Sure, thank you, Jay, and thank you for having me. Again, my name is Bill Elliott. I'm the Chief Operating Officer for the Faculty Physicians at the University of Maryland. And I get my hands in all kinds of things at the University of Maryland, but we have about 1,200 faculty members there, about 800 clinical FTEs. And my job basically is to handle all things revenue cycle. I get involved with practice management, uh, payer contracting, new business opportunities, our practice expansions, um, newly, new project coming along the way. We're going to start a centralized patient access center, also a little bit of our executive health program. So happy to be here. Thank you, Bill. Rob, turn it over to you. Thank you, Jay. Uh, so my name is Rob Lyles, and uh, I, I work at uh, Mercy Medical Center uh, in the division that's primary care uh, called uh, the Maryland Family Care. And uh, Maryland Family Care is uh, about 85 providers um, spread across the greater Baltimore area. Um, you know, we, we have some you know, reaches up to the Pennsylvania border um, and down into Southern Anne Arundel County. Um, and so uh, the, the, the physician enterprise is, is somewhat going through a change where it's been somewhat siloed in years past between the specialties and primary care. And we're uh, in the process of uh, pulling the two together and to, um, it, to look, function a lot more like one practice. So, um, but um, my scope is, is, is specifically to the primary care side. Fantastic. Thank you, Rob. John, turn it over to you, please. I'm John Mendocino. I'm the Executive Director for Centers for Advanced ENT Care. 
We formed back in 2017 to become the second largest physician owned uh, ENT group in the country. The corporation is comprised of 17 divisions with 62 physicians, 70 uh, ancillary providers and 408 employees. Uh, Cadent has 36 locations across Maryland, DC and Northern Virginia. Awesome, thank you, John. Dr. Posner, please. Yeah, my name is uh, Mark Posner. I'm an independent physician. Um, we, we, uh, we're part of Downtown Baltimore Family Care. It's a small private practice, has one physician, just me. Uh, we're also part of the MDPCP program, which is a Medicare demonstration project. And, uh, but we provide primary care to all ages and conditions. Um, we refer to specialists when appropriate. And I was trained at the uh, Family Practice Department, University of Maryland Hospital. Thank you. Awesome. Dr. Posner, thank you so much. And panelists, again, welcome. Thank you so much for uh, being willing to share your insight, your knowledge, and your expertise uh, with all of us today. Uh, we'll go ahead and get started. And, and just so the, the group knows uh, how we're structuring this, we're really going to look at three different issues. They're somewhat intertwined, but the main themes are looking at those financial issues and challenges, those operational issues and challenges, and then some of the human resource issues and challenges. Um, and as the conversations go, you'll likely see some intertwining between all three. That's how we're going to try to really structure today's uh, conversation. Um, and I think we'll go ahead and get uh, on into the financial issues uh, to start today's conversation. Okay, before we move into the discussion, um, the participants, now is the time for the first polling question. Again, please participate in these um, for your CPEs. So polling question number one is, which best describes your organization? We will leave this open until um, we get a number of uh, votes received or for a minute, whichever comes first. So please uh, vote for your organization. So um, thank you for all your responses. Here is what was shown, 40% hospital system owned, 7% independent specialty, 10% independent primary care, and 43% of you are other. Thank you for the first polling question. We can now move into the discussion. Great, thanks so much, Luke. So uh, again, to kick off, we'll, we'll talk about those financial issues. And, and the first question I think that would be really helpful is uh, talk about those significant changes that we saw in visit levels uh, and the associated reimbursement during the course of the pandemic and some of the lessons learned and takeaways uh, with that. So Bill, I'd love to start with you um, and, and get your insight on the, the scale, the depth and breadth that you saw across the different uh, specialties at uh, University of Maryland with uh, the faculty group. Sure, I can, I can provide a little bit of what we experienced. Um, you know, we, had, we had quite a bit of drop in our volumes, as everybody did, in, in particularly April and May, and we probably were at about 50% of our original volumes. We call it the pre-COVID line now. So pre-COVID, uh, you know, we were doing pretty well, and then we dropped to about 50%. And we implemented a lot of telehealth during that time as payers started to loosen some regulations. And I was really worried that our level of visit uh, on an E&M would, would drop quite a bit um, using a telemedicine visit or any type of telehealth service. And I was surprised that it didn't drop significantly. I mean, it maybe dropped two tenths of a point when you average our levels one through five. Uh, so we didn't have a huge drop there as regarding the level of visit and the reimbursement per visit. 
but we did miss out on a lot of the ancillary things that would have been done at the time of service, EKGs, vaccines, any other type of tests, point of care labs, all those types of things. Of course, you can't do through telehealth. So certainly our average bill or our average collections per visit dropped quite a bit, uh, particularly for those two and a half to three months. And we still haven't recovered fully. We're still probably operating 85, 88% of where our pre-COVID line was. So, so Jay, yeah, we, we did see a big drop in our collections per visit, but I was surprised to see that our visit level really didn't drop as much as I thought it would um, due to the, uh, the telehealth visit. And were there any other um, things that you looked at as just a, a takeaway from um, those results and how you maybe changed some of the operations from a clinical perspective? You know, I, I think if I look at it today, we are trying to convert many more of our folks back into the office that we can. Um, at the same time, trying to keep a healthy balance of some telehealth because we're having some trouble um, with socially distancing everyone in our waiting room. So we're trying to find that sweet spot of balance. And knowing that, we're trying to plan for a potential surge coming into the fall and trying to have a healthy balance of telehealth and face-to-face uh, -face visits, as we call them, through the fall. So uh, that's kind of where we're, we're trying to find that mix now. And that's been a little tricky, but I think that's, where, that's kind of the big lesson learned going forward. We couldn't go all in telehealth. Um, we have to kind of have that mix. Good point. And, and Rob, in a past conversation, you talked about some of the, the revenue reduction that you saw with your organization. Can you talk about some of your experiences and the lessons learned over the Mercy side? Yeah, absolutely. So much like Bill, we experienced uh, you know the average revenue per visit go down with telehealth um, implementation. Um, and there were some expectations that would happen. The uh, the level of visit did decline a little bit more for us than it sounds like it did uh, with Bill Bill's practice. But um, uh, there was just, it was a comfort level. We had a number of providers who weren't willing to to code anything above a level three because they they couldn't put their hands on a patient. And um, so you know they, we we said, look, you know, this is your clinical judgment is going to exercise what you know it's going to dictate what what you're going to code to. And so. Um, uh, that's, and some areas did better than others. There was, you know, I would say when you have as many providers as we have in a primary care group, you're going to see a mix. But on average, um, we we saw a little decline. And uh, but more importantly, was the revenue uh, that we saw you know, per visit go down. And that was attributed exactly like what Bill said to the uh, the, the basically the lack of ancillaries that can um, accompany in a visit in a live environment. Um, the other thing. That uh, we, uh, you know, I guess, you know, found was it just like Bill is striking that balance. How do we best use the telehealth visit going forward? Uh, right now, we're, we're well. I should say for the past two months or so, we've been working through uh, what if if we have a fall mm -hmm. surge, what does that look like, and how does telehealth play a role in that? And um, it, it certainly does, especially with sick visits, because we, you know, primary care usually, you know. Uh, uh, either you know dies or lives on its sick volume in the, the, the fall and winter, and um, and so trying to preserve you know the the business of that um, you know is is mission critical, and telehealth is going to have a huge piece of that. It, you know we have dedicated COVID clinics that have been set up adjacent to our primary care facilities, so we're able to get hands on a patient when necessary, uh, but we're going to well, you know, we're probably going to be starting with telehealth as as the uh, the first point of contact. Awesome. It, you know, Rob, I'd like to take the one piece a little step further. You're talking about the providers and saying they were nervous to code anything above a, a level three. Did you develop any sort of coding and provider education strategies to get them a little bit more comfortable to get to those higher levels? Uh, talk to us about that. Uh, was that directed to me? Correct. Yeah. You, yeah. You I gotcha. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, so yes, um, we did. Yeah, we did. We we had uh, our, our coding team is uh, very uh, physician friendly, as you can imagine, they need to be. Um, so our coding educators, I should say, and they they did work on um, tactics. Uh, you know, a lot of the docs wanted to do time based coding on this, and that becomes a bigger challenge. Um, and, and so they're 
I, I would say that there were very far and few between anything above a level four, um, but the bulk of it was a level three. Uh, we had some that were coding below a level three initially, um, and so mm -hmm. once they were once that education took place on what, what they could actually accomplish um, in that virtual visit, um, we were able to get them up at least into that, you know, a level three range. So. Great. Um, John, in our earlier conversation, you had talked about uh, figuring out the billing rules uh, for the telemedicine payers. How, how did you guys figure that out? What was your strategy of uh, getting that information and being sure it was uh, shared downstream with all the folks within the revenue cycle across the practice? We worked with an, our outside vendor um, that deals with contracting, and we worked through them to figure out which which payers were doing what. Uh, you know, every payer was some, doing something different at the time. You know, originally when we first were looking at telemedicine immediately in, in March, you know, we didn't know if we were going to have to do uh, the uh, you know the software and and get people to where they needed to be to do that you know, such as Medicare, now they, they relax the rules as well as the other uh, payers. But in the beginning it was, you know, everybody was testing out different software to see which one was the best, which one would be cost effective. Uh, and then we ultimately, you know, were able to uh, relax those rules and, and do the telemedicine. But it was, it was, you know, it was a kind of an obstacle because every every payer is something different, right? So we had to actually work through each payer's rules and make sure that everybody was following them. Good points. And, and Dr. Posner, just as a, um, a provider, you know, what did you see uh, within your own practice as it relates to those visit levels and, and how that changed uh, within your own practice? Well, when we first started, there was, there was this panic that you know, nobody knew what to do. So I went ahead and applied for all these um, uh, accelerated pay, Medicare accelerated payments. There was grants, there was the uh, pay, paycheck protection program, there was disaster loans. So I just went ahead and applied for everything I could because at that time we were panicked, we didn't know what to do. Um, we finally figured out that uh, telehealth we went 100% telehealth. Uh, what I did is I tried to reproduce what we did before by putting a, a laptop in each exam room. And uh, I'd have my assistant get the patient up on the laptop and I would come in just like I did before and do a visit. And that seemed to work out. Um, we, uh, we didn't have as much of a drop in volume as I thought. And then we made up for it because they, they paid for phone calls, which before we, we just did the phone calls for free. Now all of a sudden we're getting reimbursed for it. So uh, that sort of um, took care of the, uh, the problem of no ancillaries and uh, uh, decreased coding. But we made up for it because we, had, we were able to uh, get paid for our telephone visits. and. Uh, so that, that's worked out. So we um, turned out that we were, were doing about the same as we did before the pandemic um, revenue wise. Um, the only thing, again, uh, we worry about not being able to do a complete physical exam. So we're looking at different um, devices that are on the market um, that the patient can put on their chest and I can listen to their heart, do a one lead EKG. Um, listen to their lungs. So uh, we're trying to institute that, get that into the hands of the patient so that I can uh, do a more complete physical exam. Uh, one, one other thing that happened with us as well. One other thing that happened was um, because we're across, we're in different states and we had to worry about crossing state lines and their um, guidelines for physicians and their licensure mm -hmm. for those states. That became a, a little bit of an issue. So, it, John, I'd love to talk about that just a little bit further. What was uh, what was some of the approaches that you took once uh, you understood that, and how did you work through that to uh, get get into a good rhythm for for those providers across different states? So, some of our providers just basically opted not to treat patients outside of like, out of Maryland, for example, uh, even though they they were in Virginia, and then we had the Virginia uh, physicians see those patients so that we could make sure that we were in compliance. Because at that point, um, you know, we did not know what the rules were gonna be. Uh, we had some patients up in Pennsylvania, and so we were just concerned about crossing state lines. 
Excellent comments. And Dr. Posner, you actually did a really good job uh, teeing us up for the next uh, kind of major topic about the federal relief payments. Um, so I, I'd love to learn a little bit more uh, too what uh, your organization did um, and, and you know, some of your thoughts about current state, future state uh, with handling those uh, federal relief funds. Uh, yeah, we, um, I, like I said, we panicked at the beginning and I applied for everything I could think of. Um, the, I found that the uh, payers were very generous. Uh, we got grants, we got the PPP, we got the Medicare accelerated payments and the disaster loans. So we, we had all this money coming in. Uh, what I worried about is uh, having to pay it back. Uh, from what I understand, the Medicare accelerated payment, um, they would pay us what they think we were going to bill for the next three months. And then from what I understand, they would, uh, at some point, uh, we would not get paid because we've already gotten that money. So that, that would be a problem. Um, and then, you know, the, uh, the PPP, I think we can, have enough, uh, we have enough expense to, to have that forgiven. Um, the disaster loans are very low interest over a long period of time, so I don't think that's going to be a problem. And then the grant money is grant money, so uh, I think we're good there. Wonderful. And John, you had an interesting point about uh, what your organization did with uh, the payments. Would you mind explaining a little bit more? We did the same thing. I mean, we, well, first, suddenly we had, um, you know, uh, payments just arriving in our bank account overnight with no, no information. And that came from Health and Human Services to buy PPE equipment. Um, we got two, uh, two payments, large payments that came in overnight. Then we did apply for the PPP program, which that was kind of a, an interesting obstacle because I filled out paperwork three times, three applications, three different times. We did get it in the first round, which was a good thing. Uh, but the big, the big thing was that we applied for the Medicare accelerated payments. Um, and we were just basically holding on to that money to see where, you know, where this was all going to shake out and kind of use that as a, a last resort if we needed. Uh, then Medicare came out and basically was saying that there's not going to be anything associated with an EOB and you know so basically what we did was we returned that money we we sent it all back before that 90 days uh, rolled around uh, a, a lot of the large ENT groups across the country I said on a forum there had also done the same thing because we were really concerned that we would not be able to determine who who needs to get paid who doesn't get paid who is protection plan or payments um, we could not use the HHO PE now they allow you to use it for other things you cannot use uh, the programs in conjunction with one another you have to wait for oh, wonderful thank you um, Rob, I, I'd love to uh, get your thoughts on how Mercy changed some of the um, billing uh, practices and how you build patients during the pandemic. Um, so we uh, actually, I would say, probably made the most minimal changes. Um, we have always been, um, I guess you would say, patient-friendly with our billing and collection practices. Um, so it, it takes a lot to get someone to go, you know, for us to take a patient to collections. Um, so, um, but we did uh, apply for um, all the, uh, the payer specific, uh, you know, all the rules that were changing around copay waivers, we implemented those. Um, you know, that was, you know, um, you know, you know, Care First as an example, you know, waived uh, the patient copay uh, for telehealth visits. So, um, and, um, but it, as far as, uh, uh, you know, our, I guess our, on the collection side of it, um, you know, we uh, typically, you know, we've, we've been a less aggressive, I guess, than maybe others as, as, as that comes in, just in general, in normal times. Mm -hmm. So um, that largely didn't, didn't change. So we, um, we know the patients are, you know, many of them have, you know, lost jobs and things like that. So we, we accommodate when we can. And, um, you know, we, um, I'd say, are, are very friendly in that regard. <laughs> so not a lot of change there. But it sounded like the, the strategy that you guys had in place pre-COVID 
really helped you to mitigate any sort of issues from a patient financial services perspective. Yeah, exactly. Uh, Bill, uh, can you talk to us about the experiences that uh, you had over at the University of Maryland? In the way we changed our patient billing, uh, we significantly changed the way we, we bill our patients, particularly around the uh, suspension of placing accounts with a collection agency. So we still continue to bill patients and send them statements. But April, March and April, we were getting lots of phone calls from a lot of unfortunate individuals who had lost their jobs and were not unable to pay any of their balances. And we internally just did not think it was the right thing to do to continue to done these people through the uh, billing cycle and send them to a collection agency. So early on, first part of April or so, we suspended all collection agency placements uh, for all patients, which, which hurt us a bit. It hurt us on a little bit of collection dollars. It certainly threw our uh, accounts receivable metrics uh, into AWIRE because we were having all kinds of days in AR and accounts receivable over 90 days and all the metrics that everyone looks at, we had a lot of explaining to do there. Um, but at the end of the day, it was the right thing to do. Uh, we are starting to now open that valve a little bit and starting to place some more accounts with the collection agency. We're still getting some calls, but not like we were in the beginning. So it really did change the way we, we build our patients. And do you think if there's another spike in the fall that you might resolve back to that same uh, scenario if the, the spike comes back as uh, folks are talking about? Yeah, I definitely think we will, particularly if there is a large uh, unemployment uh, statistic that goes along with that. That's really why we did it. And we didn't want to be the organization that continued to send people to collections when there was a big crisis going on. So. Uh, we suspended that. Like I said, we're slowly doing it now, but not in the way we did before. If I had to change one thing, it's just more behind the scenes in the way we operationalized the holding of these accounts. Um, and I don't want, I could take forever talking about that, but uh, we probably would have done some things in the background a little differently to hold or flag those accounts. Because now we're having a little bit of, of trouble identifying which ones should have gone when, which accounts should have gone when. So if we do this next time around, I'll be better prepared. Good point. And Dr. Posner, you had a very uh, interesting uh, perspective on how some of your uh, billing practices change. Would you mind elaborating? Yeah, um, we, we, uh, a lot of our patients felt sorry for us. So, so they paid their bills. We didn't, we didn't turn any, we, we didn't have very aggressive collections beforehand. Um, so we, we certainly didn't do any after the COVID, but, um, you know, people, we, we got a lot of phone calls um, worrying about us that we were going to go out of practice. That, so, uh, and, and, you know, so we didn't discourage that. So uh, people did pay their bills. So we did not see any uh, reduction in collections at all uh, from, pay, from the patient side. And uh, certainly the, uh, the uh, third party payers have been very generous. Uh, and so we haven't seen any any reduction in that side either. So we, we've been so we're we're about the same as we were pre-pandemic uh, financially. Wonderful. And then related to uh, you know talking about budgets and how the pandemic uh, impacted budgets, Bill, you had mentioned uh, at the very beginning uh, the deep decrease in volume and what that had done. Can you walk us through the uh, the experiences that? Uh, faculty physicians had, and then just some of those strategies and lessons learned from a budget management standpoint uh, during COVID and what you may have to do if there's another spike. Yeah, you start me off on the tough one, Jay. This is, this, the budget was not a fun <laughs> thing to do with uh, the end of our fiscal year 2020 and going into 21. Uh, as soon as we saw our volumes pr pretty much plummet, we put a freeze on everything. We put a freeze on any new hires. We put a freeze on any type of new projects we might be we might want to start outside consulting or engagements. We kind of froze everything um, just to see where this was going to take us and how long it was going to we were going to suffer through this. And then during the and we reallocated some staff. We didn't lay off anybody during that whole process. We just kind of reallocated them to where they needed to where we needed help, whether it was screening at the front desk or outside of a building, helping our lab. Uh, doing all kinds of things like that. Now, when we got into FY21 budget, which for us starts July 1st, 
we had to make a tough guess, as I'm sure everybody else on the panel is, what do we think our revenue is going to look like next year? And we think we took a pretty conservative approach, but time will tell. And we did have to make some really tough choices on some staffing. Uh, that was the most painful part of the job, of any job. And what we had to do is, luckily, because we had a freeze in place since March or April, um, we cut in my shop alone almost 30 positions uh, right from the budget. But about 26 or 27 of them were already vacant positions because we had the freeze in place. So it really only, it, it affected a few, a handful of people. But what's nice is we're seeing our volumes rebound, so we're able to bring those folks back on. Uh, so I, I'd say the staffing side, Jay, was probably one of the toughest things we had to do um, in an organization. And we still are very conservative going forward next year with our revenue projections and any new projects or new things like that. We're, we're kind of just kind of battening down the hatches for FY21 and just seeing where it takes us. Absolutely. And, and Rob, I'm curious, uh, in Mercy, did you have a, a similar approach in terms of your uh, budget management uh, perspective? We did. Um, so uh, this was, you know, because of when I joined Mercy, this was my first kind of seeing a cycle of transition from one budget year to another. Uh, so I was expecting to be some differences from where I was before. Uh, but then COVID happened. <laughs> and it, was, um, it became a new playbook for everybody. Um, so we, uh, we did for a moment in time, uh, you know, uh, in April, we uh, basically suspended all new hiring. Um, we didn't lay anybody off, though. Uh, through the pro through the, the uh, through that that tough period of March April May um, that we uh, and since we haven't but um, the the expectations for you know where we would end in FY20 obviously changed uh, we you know that, that that budget book had been closed you know well ahead of the uh, the pandemic um, but you know given you know the the sudden drop in volume across the board not only in um, on the ambulatory side but also the fact that the hospital itself you know wasn't doing any elective surgeries for a while um, it, it was you know uh, somewhat devastating across the board um, so what we ended up doing was uh, because we had created the FY21 budget obviously also pre-pandemic um, it was retooling that budget to say okay, what, what is a realistic volume going forward knowing that our uh, on the ambulatory side our volumes were cut 50% back in March and and just like Bill had said we also are, are hovering around 85 to 90 percent of pre-COVID volumes and we can't seem to get above that so we said okay well then let's you know let's try to keep things realistic for the institution let's you know actually you know reformat the budget um, you know for FY21 uh, knowing where we are today and, and trying to create some realistic growth in there um, and, um, but we're also, we're also going to do quarterly review. So um, it's actually, it feels like monthly at this point, um, but because, uh, you know, August was not quite as good as we had hoped it could be, you know, compared to July. Um, but so we are going to, I've never been in a budget year where you, we may actually re-evaluate re the budget every quarter <laughs> like this, but uh, uh, that's, where we're, that's where we're headed. Good points. Um, John, knowing that um, your group has folks across all the different states, did that change anything with your strategy from a budget standpoint? And if so, what were some of the takeaways that you all learned? No, realistically, what we did at corporate, we, we froze all um, projects that were going on in, in every state at that point from a corporate standpoint. We chose not to lay off any employees of uh, for a multitude of reasons. And one was the PPP program. Uh, they don't wanna see you uh, laying anybody off during that time period. And we did not lay anybody off and we have not um, since. And, uh, and, our pro and our time frame is up in October for the PPP program. But uh, you know, our operations just basically stopped as far as any new you know, projects out there for uh for the time being and we just finally started getting back on track in the last probably four weeks uh starting to move you know move forward with our projects uh that we were working on prior to that but as far as employees uh, you know back in march our our board 
you know, the very first board meeting we had in March was not to lay anybody off, and that's what we chose not to do. So our, you know, so that that hit our bottom line as well. Got it. And, and Dr. Posner, just to, to bring us home on this financial issues topic, uh, any major changes to to your budgets or what you saw within your practice? Uh, no, uh, we're we're just we're all in with telemedicine. We're going to continue that as long as the uh, payers allow us to do that. Um, for various reasons, but um, it's a lot less expensive um, to operate on a telemedicine uh, platform than it is to see patients in the in the office. Uh, so we'll do that as far, as long as we can. Um, so you know it's working out great for us so far. So hopefully it'll it'll continue. What we worry about is when uh, when everybody says no, you know we're not going to pay for telemedicine anymore. We're not going to pay for phone calls. Uh, we want and we want the money back from Medicare, the accelerated payments. Then, then we got some problems. Uh, so we try to we're trying to put away some money for those eventualities. But otherwise, we're going to uh, continue to operate. You know, very small staff. Um, continue 100% telemedicine, and uh, you know that's all we can do at this point. Fantastic. Well, that closes our uh, talk on the financial issues. We'll get ready to transition to the operational issues. Uh, and Luke, I believe there's a polling question before we get started. Yes, there is. Uh, so everyone, it is time for the second polling question. This is in regard to what we talked about with some of those federal relief funds. So we are asking, did your organization apply for federal relief funds? Great, thank you. It looks like the majority of you did apply for some federal relief funds, so I hope that the conversation uh, around that topic was enlightening, and let's hope that the government gets it figured out uh, a little bit better if they come out with this again, so it's not as stressful for everyone. Great, Jay, we can move on to the next topic. Fantastic, Luke, thank you so much. So um, now diving into the operational issues, and, and I think this first question we really got uh, got into when we were talking about the financial impacts uh, with it. Um, but I think deeper down uh, to the next level, we really want to kind of understand the uh, maintaining effective social and physical distancing once things start started to open up, and how you had to reorient your your practices around that. Um, and John, I, I'd love to start with you. Uh, again, you've got uh, locations all across the area. Did you have kind of a uniform approach? Did you have to take different approaches just based on spacing? Talk to us about the uh, issues, challenges, and learning moments there. The, the, board, um, the board kept meeting. I mean, we met probably once a week, <laughs> uh, coming up with policies and procedures. And so the first thing we did was we took, you know, second and third seats out of our waiting rooms, which of course limited the space. Uh, and it was individual because each division, you know, setup is different, which buildings they're in. And so some of the divisions actually rented vacant space to create second um, waiting rooms within the building so that we could continue to see a patient load um, without, you know, affecting the, the flow of patients through the practice. Uh, so that was, that was an interesting um, side to that, that we were, you know, and that actually came up from some of the physicians that was, you know, they were coming up with ideas on what, what to do. The other thing is, you know, in the beginning, it wasn't so bad because we, were, we had enough staff to sit at the door, take people's temperatures, ask the questions when they, you know, were coming in about COVID. Um, but as we started to ramp back up, that became an issue because our employees needed to be back in their original positions, and then we needed extra um, bodies to actually be at that door and every one of our divisions. So that, that was either adding a stress to the, the actual site or the um, cost to have another person brought in to do that. 
Interesting. And in, um, did it create uh, an initial bottleneck that you're able to figure out? And once you figured out the bottleneck, what was, what was the ants that seemed to be the most universally accepted across the board? I mean, they actually ended up ultimately uh, repurposing someone's job uh, to do that. I mean, that, that was, at that point, it was just basically we needed to fill this position and quickly because, you know, we had patients coming back and we wanted to make sure we could treat them. So uh, we basically repurposed people. We did actually share some uh, you know, employees between divisions as well. Mm. Interesting. Um, Rob, uh, to turn it over to you for the kind of the same question of um, how you started to maintain that social physical distancing within the practice and uh, if there were changes and takeaways that you had from your experiences at Mercy. Sure, yes. Yeah. So we, um, we never totally shut down in the ambulatory side. You know, even when we went to telemedicine, I think it was March 16th or something. Um, we, what we did uh, in, in parallel with that was we, we created two cohorts of doctors in every one of our clinics. So uh, half of the team would actually come to work uh, for two weeks while the other half was, was at home doing 100% telemedicine. And, um, and the, the ones that were coming into the office, they, they, we allowed them to, uh, if, you know, some of, the, some of our offices have two exam rooms per provider, others had three. Uh, but we basically were able to give them double the amount of exam room space um, of whatever they would normally have uh, so that when patients were coming in or are coming in, they were able to, we could avoid the waiting room. Um, we thinned out the waiting room you know, with chairs anyway. So, but the idea was, you know, try to do as much real time bringing, you know, taking the patient into the clinical space um, and having them held in the exam rooms as their waiting room, essentially. Um, so at the front door of all of our facilities, uh, everybody gets screened, um, employees and, uh, and the, the patients. Um, we had a no visitor policy in place too, which was really designed to limit the number of people coming in to the facility. And um, um, so the screening practice, uh, you know, is, uh, I think everybody is probably aware of the questions that are out there, you know, CDC guideline questions, as well as taking someone's temperature and hand sanitizing. Um, and then we, the other thing that we did is we, to the extent possible, we created a touch-free check-in experience. Uh, and we used my, uh, in my chart with, you know, it's a, it's a, site, a piece of Epic. Um, are, we uh, have a, a good number, a majority of our patients are on my chart, but getting them to use it consistently has always been a struggle. So we thought, okay, well, at least with those who are my chart activated, we can get them to um, do most of the, they can do actually everything uh, on their cell phone if they have one. Um, uh, we actually turned off the kiosk for a while because we were concerned about touching things. Um, and then the non my chart patients, you know, we, we still had to, to process them through the, the check-in process the, in our traditional manner. Um, but um, let's see, the, the other thing that we did was we used our, uh, in a small, particularly in the smaller sites, we, um, uh, extended our waiting room into the parking lot, and we used a, a company called Long Range Systems, uh, which provided bi-directional texting. So when the patient arrived, they would, it would actually pre-arrival, pre they received a message from us to let us know by text when they arrived. And when they arrived in the parking lot, um, you know, they informed us, and, and so we could have them wait in their car until they um, were, ready to, were ready for them to come into the building. Wonderful. And Dr. Posner, you'd mentioned earlier that you pretty much went to straight telehealth. So I don't think there was a whole lot of social distancing issues, but uh, you said something earlier I thought that was really interesting where, you know, the patients get those monitoring devices that you could then place on them, do a read from, from your office. So it sounded like you're able to maintain social distancing with your implementation of telemedicine, but incorporate some, some additional things to even make it better. Can you talk a little bit more about that from the operational side and what you learned from that? Yeah, um, again, um, I was not, you know, I'm, I, I'm, we're 100% telemedicine. So I was a little concerned that we were going to miss things uh, by not having a phys good physical exam. So, um, you know, I looked into there is a device that um, what I've done is I, I sent visiting nurses out with this device to the patient's home. And um, that way I was able to get, you know, really good vital signs. Uh, I could I could remotely listen to the heart and lungs. Uh, I could get a one lead EKG, 
and I could also get blood work. So that's that's basically what we've been doing to try to fill in that gap um, of not having a complete physical exam, uh, make sure we're not missing anything. Um, yeah, the other part um, that I was going to talk about, I don't know if you even want to hear about this, we, we also have an um, ambulatory surgery center. It's part of our uh, building. And in that way, we, uh, we, did, um, we, we asked each person who was going to get a procedure to have a test for COVID. They had to have a negative test. Uh, then, of course, when they came, you know, we would uh, do a fever check. Um, we had uh, only one patient at one person at a time could come in. You know, if they had rides, people had to wait outside. And uh, so, so and that's, and then we got, you know, we got the protection, personal protection equipment from the Maryland Department of Health. That was very helpful. We got that free, free PPE. So we were able to operate um, in the surgery center, but for the practice that that's, it wasn't an issue because we're not seeing anybody in the practice. Yeah. And Bill, just to bring us home on this particular issue, how did it work with FPI and all the different practices across the, the region? Yeah, that, we, we, we clearly found out we couldn't have one policy for all of our practice locations around the state. So we, we kind of left it up to each manager, but we had multiple meetings a day making sure we were, we were in check there. Many of the things that my colleagues on the, on the call did, we did as well, except I did learn a couple of things from, from everybody here. The one thing I could add is we did have to have separate entrance and exit pathways. And we also were very clear about having some type of isolation area where if someone did come in and they had a fever or they had that, remember early on, we even asked if you traveled. I don't think we're, anybody's doing that now, but um, we asked if you traveled. Then, then they quickly got escorted to a whole nother route and a whole nother path and, and were isolated. In, in area. So you can imagine if we have a small office, that's really hard to do. And, and uh, bigger offices a little easier. Uh, we had to get creative, but, but basically we did a lot, many of the things that my colleagues on the phone did, um, but we did have to have a lot of isolation areas. Got it. In, in keeping it with, uh, with you, Bill, as we go to the next question about PPE, what, how did the supply chain of medical logistics work? I and mean, did you have to create any you know, strategic partnerships maybe to increase that, that PPE supply? Yeah, that was a little tough. So, so our ambulatory operations, as I said, we have some small practices and we have some really large practices. And they usually just take care of ordering their, their PPE directly from vendors. Uh, we have a major contract, but they, when they need something at one office, they just place the order and it gets delivered. Well, that supply chain was getting, getting thinned out from the, our vendors and they were really having trouble maintaining and keeping up with that because they were really trying to keep orders on, our in, on all the hospitals and inpatient side. So we really struggled there. And we were touch and go there for a few months. And what we ended up doing is we ended up connecting with our hospital partners supply chain as well and kind of ask them to be the buying entity for us because uh, they were at the top of the food chain on the PPE side. So we ended up using them and still to this day, they're our backstop um, if we run into any issues with N95s or any of those types of hard to get things. But it did change the way we ordered and it changed the way we tried to uh, conserve some of that. Uh, so yeah, Jay, to answer your question, we did find some unique opportunities, but it was within our own family uh, to help, su help supply chain that for us. Got it. It, John, um, going uh, with uh, your organization, was it corporate that kind of drove a lot of that? Was it driven down to a little bit more of the divisional level? Talk us through how it worked with all the, your different entities. Usually our divisions order separately, um, but you know, as supplies started to dwindle, uh, we ended up taking in, we did two big um, orders uh, through corporate, which is not normal, and we did that. But a couple of issues that, that arose, we ordered the supplies um, and, you know, we were promised by X date, which of course that did not happen. Uh, it got stuck in actually Baltimore uh, Harbor waiting for it to be released. So we had, you know, it was like an extra two or three weeks for some of the supplies to get to us uh, because they were actually held, at, held in our harbor here uh, trying to get, I wanted to drive up my car and drive my car up there and, and get the supplies actually. 
And then we also, um, I, we had a, a talk with all the divisions and told them to, um, when they got extremely low, like we had a couple divisions with, with problems with face masks. So we would, you know, take a box of face masks over to another division or, or to that type of thing. But um, we were able to pretty much, you know, stay the course, but, you know, we did do two bulk orders. Got it. And Rob at Mercy, uh, I remember our uh, conversation around your ambulatory quality group and they kind of change a lot of stuff that you're doing with PP. Uh, would you mind explaining a little bit more about that and some of what you guys learned with, uh, with that uh, development? Sure. Yeah. We, and uh, so we were doing the same thing. Every, every practice location would order their own supplies. And um, that was much like everybody else has spoken here that that was proving to be an issue. And um so our, our uh, quality team uh, became part of our, uh, basically they pivoted <laughs> and became our, uh, our central uh, supply, you know, channel, you know, so they, they were ordering on behalf of the entire, you know, uh, you know, health system basically. Um, and then that, that, that purchasing power, you know, was, you know, we were able to get inventory in through that and then, you know, just, distribute, you know, um, appropriately to wherever we needed it. Um, but, you know, the, the other piece of it was that we, uh, our, our hospital wasn't hit nearly as hard as, as um, Tom's or Hopkins, was, you know, had, had was at the time. So we had, we certainly had some COVID patients in the hospital, but, you know, every COVID patient you add, you, you're burning through PPE far faster than, than um, you know, in our case where we weren't burning as much. Um, so controlling the PPE usage was a big part of, you know, of, of what we had, you know, what we felt like we needed to do to preserve, you know, supply because we knew, you know, felt like we were being, we were getting lucky early on, uh, you know, being able to one uh, order through central ordering, essentially a process that we created ad hoc, but then also, um, you know, uh, uh, you know, being fortunate and not having large volumes of COVID sick patients in the hospital, so. Um, so it was, it was, you know, conservation of supply coupled with uh, the quality team stepping in to help, you know, centralize ordering. Got it. Um, and then to help close us out on, on this topic with the uh, operational issues um, around office hours, Dr. Posner, particularly interested from your perspective as an uh, independent uh, practice, did you have to shift office hours or because you were telemedicine, you kind of kept the same? What was your experience and what was uh, the takeaway? So we, uh, we kept the same hours that we did. We didn't change any hours, but because it was telemedicine, I was able to do um, visits from my home. So I, I saw people, um, you know, in the evening and weekends, um, in addition uh, to, to our regular office hours. So, um, you know, it was like good news and bad news. The good news is people could see me whenever they wanted. The bad news is they could see me whenever they wanted. It was, it was kind of an imposition on my time, but um, was able, I was able to do that. So, you know, we had the same office hours, but I was able to do more visits uh, at, from home. Got it. And John, uh, did you guys leave it to provider discretion? Uh, did the divisions or corporate kind of give a uh, direction on office hours? It was, it was left to the divisions and the physicians. Um, the physicians, you know, I just like, uh, it was just noted that our physicians did telemedicine from home at night, uh, weekends, uh, but mainly the, the schedules were left at the divisional level. Got it. Uh, I think this is a great conversation around the operational issues uh, and just being cognizant of time, we'll shift over to uh, close out with the HR issues. Uh, before we do, uh, Luke is back with another uh, polling question for us. Yes, the third polling question will, oh, sorry. The third polling question is, has your organization implemented telehealth? Um, I'll only leave this question open for 30 seconds to be cognizant of time. So please submit your answers um, quickly and then we will move on to the HR issues. Thank you. Looks like 90% of you did implement some telehealth. So again, hopefully that conversation around that was helpful. All right, Jay, we can now move on to the HR issues. Thanks. 
No, thank you, Luke. And I think uh, we'll, we'll go through this about as quick as we can just to be cognizant of uh, everybody's time. Um, but I'm curious to know, uh, you know the challenges that the pandemic presented for, for your staff. And uh, Rob, I'll start with you and your experiences uh, at Mercy. Uh, we talked already a little bit about any sort of reductions, but what did you have to do to fundamentally change things for your staff? Yeah, so uh, our goal number one was to preserve our workforce uh, with all of this, you know, with, related to HR, you know, matters. And so uh, we made a conscious decision to not have any layoffs through the process, even those, you know, at low census kind of typical scenarios where you might think of laying somebody off, uh, we, we preserved everybody's employment. Um, there was a different type of work to be done, but it, so they were certainly working in different scopes. Um, the, uh, the other part of it was that um, you know, our, you know, our staff or our, you know, people in the community, just, you know, like the, all the patients. And so uh, thinking through ways to, to balance the, the fear that they have and the, the things that they're going through with children not being in school and, and, and all that proposed a lot of challenges. So we ended up uh, uh, going to a, a telework uh, environment for many of the divisions that could do that, you know, obviously, you know, if you're patient facing, that becomes challenging. Um, but uh, you know, where where we have uh, any of the the shared services, you know, you know, revenue cycle or finance, uh, you know, is, is too as an example, um, many were able to go you know work from home for the first time, and they, they're many of them are actually still doing that. Wonderful. And Bill, just from the um, repurposing step, you highlighted a little bit about this earlier. Talk to us about uh, how you're able to effectively do that um, uh, across the board, particularly with the lab piece that was uh, growing. Yeah, effectively do that is kind of the trick question there. We, we tried the best we could uh, because we did have actually too many staff, you know, during that April and May where we just weren't having enough volume. We weren't having enough um, billing in, billing volume. So we had a lot of staff and like others, we weren't going to lay people off. So we had to find use for them. So we tried to take their skill set and apply it. So if, if we had uh, extra MA help, we tried to move them out. Actually, we, we did some online or some screening outside of our buildings um, for temperature checks and so forth. Our billing folks who have a little bit more insurance information, when the state kind of uh, asked us to step up and do the COVID testing here. We had no interfaces in place. We had no automatic processes at all for getting people in, people's information into our system. So we used our billing folks as fast as we could to manually enter all this information into our, our, our lab systems. So we, we just checked on this all the time and I was kind of the point where People would, would email me when they needed something, they need some help here, and I would be managing this pool of extra resources. So I had kind of two balls in the air, one that was saying, I need help here, and then others saying, I have lots of extra people here. And then I was kind of the conduit of trying to make up matches and get them to work. And then, you know, you quickly move into, well, who's gonna pay for this and all that stuff. And I, I basically had to referee a lot of that and said, just keep track of it, we'll take care of it. Let's just get this, let's just get this done. So it was much easier. Lesson learned it was probably much easier to have one person be the point for mm -hmm. the comings and goings. Uh, so then people weren't just kind of doing it all on themselves. So, so that was a big help. Really good point and uh, takeaway. Thank you, Bill. Um, John, with, uh, with your group, uh, any interesting takeaways around uh, repurposing the staff or just shifting those resources around? Not really. I mean, our, our divisions work independently, basically, of, of corporate. We allow them, you know, to be um, on their own and, and make their, those decisions. So they were making the decisions of who's coming in, who's staying at home on their, on, on, at that divisional level. The one thing um, I will say is that, you know, the, the issues around that is how do you get people home work remotely from home, get them set up, that type of thing, and get those resources to them as well. Uh, so that was probably our biggest challenges of, you know, getting employees to home and repurposing their jobs uh, was probably more the IT side than any. Got it. 
And then uh, Dr. Posner, we'll uh, have you bring us home and just talk about what you did to uh, motivate and keep the staff morale high. So you had a couple of really good comments during our uh, initial discussion. Well, I think uh, initially, well, first of all, we have um, uh, meetings uh, that they call huddles every morning where we try to get everybody up to speed about what's going on and uh, make sure that they're okay, that they're not having any uh, problems that they're bringing from home um, and that they're, you know, they're ready to go to work. So that, that's really been, even though it doesn't sound like much, it, it really helped uh, with the morale. We also gave hazard pay at the beginning, which was one week salary extra, um, which was, uh, which was, with, uh, was encouraged by uh, the powers that be. So we, we did give pa hazard pay. We are allowing people, we have one person uh, who had to bring their child to work? We allowed that uh, because of you know they didn't weren't able to go to school or whatever, and um, we try to bring uh, lunches in. Uh, try to uh, every every once in a while I, I'll bring in uh, bagels and cream cheese just just to keep uh, keep everybody's spirits up. So that's uh, that's pretty much it. We have a lean staff to begin with, so we didn't really lay anybody off. Or, so. Absolutely. I think that, that'll conclude the portion around the HR issues. Uh, and I know we've got, I think, a final polling question. But uh, to start again uh, for our panel, thank you all very much, Dr. Posner, John, Rob, and Bill. This was great insight. Um, and Luke, I'll let you uh, close this out with this final polling question, please. Sure. And I actually think, Jay, just to be cognizant of everybody's time, we will forego the, the, the final polling question. The three will be sufficient for your CPEs. Don't, do not worry about that. I did just have closing remarks. Again, I want to say thank you to all our panelists for taking time and volunteering for HMA, HFMA. What a wonderful organization to offer uh, an opportunity like this for learning, and I hope it was helpful for, for you all. Uh, thank you to Jay for volunteering to moderate the, the panel as well. You did a wonderful job. Um, again, thank you very, very much. The final thing that I would like to have everybody keep note of um, as I will show our sponsorship slide again. These are the people who make Eddie Chef and May possible. Thank you to all of our wonderful sponsors. Please note that our registration for the fall conference is now available. It is a little different this year because it will all be virtual, but there will still be a great agenda of, of learning objectives and topics, and we hope to see you all there. So with that, um, I will kind of end the presentation. Thank you for your time. If we did not get to answer your question and you have submitted it in the Q&A, um, Jay has already noted that he will um, get back to you and get some responses from the panelists for you on that. So thank you very much, everyone. We appreciate your time. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah.